What did you think of the sale, Alex? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. It gets better. Lot, yes. yes. But even without that, it's been getting better every year because they've been putting so much. They've really gotten serious about the improvements. It's turning into a major sale. What's your favorite part of coming here? That is close. <laughs> yeah, the drive is really beautiful and pleasant, but the people are great. So um, I enjoy catching up with everyone every year. So why don't you tell everybody how you got started in Long Island? I had a small piece of property in California and I got some mini Longhorns because I thought small ranch, small cows. And then I realized that I, researching the mini Longhorns, which are registered with the TLBAA, um, that I thought the big ones were more interesting. So when I finally got a bigger ranch up here in Oregon, uh, I had an opportunity to pursue that. And at first it was just going to be a few, like everybody. And, um, and now it's kind of gotten out of control. <laughs> and how many years ago was that? Um, I bought my first big ones in 2007, 2008, but I had minis for a couple years before that. Okay, and how many head do you have now? Um, all, all, everybody, wieners, the whole thing, probably 140. Um, I think this year I have a hundred breeding age females, uh, you know, with bulls in production. So, um, I like that size. It allows experimentation. It allows me to use a variety of bulls and, um, play. I really enjoy it. And just better odds that if you breed that many, you'll probably end up with some, a uh, higher number of really good ones. At least that's how it seems to work. So what bulls are you experimenting with now or using now? Yeah, I'm using a concealed weapon, mm -hmm. Archer Texa. I have a young cowboy up check son. I have a uh, three-year-old uh, cowboy tough check son. And I've got some archer sons in the wings and I'm always looking for another good young bull. So um, I have a diversity of bloodlines. I like running several bulls because I know now for the next several years I'll be able to interweave those genetics without uh, getting too close and um, so I, I just, it's a lot of fun. So a lot of people might not know that you, I mean this is your thing, you pretty much do this on your own. Yes. Um, you do all the research, you do all the work, you do all the hauling, all that sort of stuff. Um, I like, do, I what, do. How do you think that makes it a little bit different? like being a female having to do all that? Well, I don't want to ignore the fact I do get help from my husband who's an old, who's been a cowboy all his life. He's not, it's not his passion, but he's certainly there to help. Um, and I do um, use uh, Justin Rombeck's consultancy. I enjoy that. He's a lot of fun. And since he's so experienced with the industry, he gives me information I wouldn't otherwise be able to get. But I do, do the majority of the work myself and plan my programs and research my nutrition and I live in the middle of my cows my fields are all around the house so I'm with them and watch them daily and miss them when I'm not there and um, I I really enjoy that if I couldn't live with them if I could only see them once a week I think I wouldn't be as interested yeah. I know a lot of people manage that very well but for me I enjoy the fact that we're a family and we know each other really well mm -hmm. and um, it's a lot of fun. I have horses too I'm very serious about but the, somehow the cattle engage me more now. I'm, I'm sort of easing out of the horses. The cattle I find fascinating. And so. you're, what kind of horses do you have? Lusitano horses. horses from and you Portugal. travel all over for them? I right? used to travel quite a bit to Portugal and Brazil um, for them. Now, I, but now my time is going to Longhorn events. I don't do so much with the horses now. It's just a natural transitioning transition that's happening. So we got the opportunity to visit your ranch last year and we mm -hmm. were really excited, I know, to learn about how the Oregon Trail went through it yeah. and that sort of stuff. Is it? Do you think you see different challenges raising longhorns on that terrain than, you know, like what folks in Texas or Oklahoma do? You know, I, I would assume so only because we have weather extreme, we have certainly the cold as a factor, which mm -hmm. Uh, the southern half doesn't really have um, 
but the flip side of that is due to our winters we have fantastic grass when it finally does grow um, something about the winter dormancy makes very potent grass in the spring and summer so it it's a give and take and I really like I like that and as long as I feed the longhorns keep their energy levels up they handle the cold very very well I mean sub-zero cold for for every night for two weeks sometimes and they come through it and I'm impressed because I don't think that's really what they were initially designed for but um, since since the upside is the beautiful grass and um, I, I think on the dry climate which I think is easier on them sometimes than the humidity then you do irrigation as well. and we irrigate yeah we have to irrigate other we're in a desert that otherwise has about 10 inches of rain a year if we're lucky so what sorts of things do you find that you can do locally or within this region to market your cattle that help you make more private treaty sales and such that's a good question I don't do I, I mostly do national advertising and promotion with an intent to reach nationally I haven't developed a program that is a local program I like to support local activities like this and some other things that are within a day's driving distance um, I do sell some animals locally I sell young bulls to beef breeders for heifer bulls so as long as I have a pri animals at all price points, um, I can capture a, some local traffic. But um, I haven't seen a, a big payoff yet in focusing only on my area. My area is a really serious desert government permit cow-calf area the long they, these folks don't see the longhorn um, as important to their pro program except for the occasional heifer bull so it's hard to get them to see a value in our females beyond what they would see the value of a good Angus range cow so it's a little tricky I, I'm I like to support local breeders um, I'm I do extend, um, I do have some local folks with smaller herds who bring cows over to run with my bulls because it's a bull they otherwise would have trouble accessing, those kind of things. So I'll do what I can to, to contribute to everybody's happiness and success around me. And if we sell, a, if I sell them a half or two, I'll, that's great, you know. So what do you do on a national level to help promote? Utilize social media. Um, Facebook seems to be the the primary place I go. I, I'm not on Twitter because I really don't know how to do it. Um, I live in an area with no cell service, so it means that things like Twitter don't uh, aren't something I can access on a regular basis. And so I run some national advertising in print, but less every year, and do more in the way of internet e-blasts, utilizing hired hands mailing lists or the breed organizations mailing lists. Um, sometimes my own, but my own isn't as good as theirs. And so I, I um, the other thing is I advertise in sale catalogs. I still think there's value in that print advertising because pretty much everyone will pick that up and look at it seriously at once or twice, I think, more than a magazine. What's yeah. the best advice you have for other breeders? <sighs> um... I think about this a lot because my views on things have changed. I think you have to determine where your comfort levels are. I mean, I I probably have spent a little more money on cows than than some other folks, but at the same time, I'm nowhere near the league of of some of the the big guys who can who can buy the best in every sale so I've had to figure out how to maximize the cows I can afford with good bull selection and I guess the thing I've learned the most is the buy decent cows but have a limit on how much you, you, you'll put into any one cow and spend good money on a bull I think I think if you would never spend 10,000 on a cow 
do spend ten thousand on a bull if you're serious if you if you see this as a potential business and you intend to sell um, for good prices I think the the bull can move your program at least it moved mine getting good quality bulls and being willing to spend uh, money in that direction uh, really moved me along you can do it with AI too as a matter of fact it's probably even smarter money to um, to buy semen from these good bulls and I'm just prefer to have the bull do the work so um, I've, I've bought the bulls themselves but I think I think in other dairy and beef areas they know this they know that investing in bulls is critical to advancing your program and it's easy to get caught up in the beauty of any single cow with beautiful hide and huge horns um, but I think in fact the same money spent on a superior bull will move everything on your property forward whereas the single cow may only um, generate a, a, a few individuals that's that's what I've learned so far I used to think I needed to focus on the biggest prettiest cow and that's great to have but um, I can't afford to do it that way and um, then the bull if I get the right bull he'll make me some and I won't have to spend the big bucks so what do you First, they have to have a, a, they have to be physically sound. They have to have um, correct anatomy as bull anatomy um, for reproductive success. But beyond, and that's just makes sense to um, mechanically to, to get calves out of as many cows as possible. But um, it's tricky. It's tricky. You have to do a lot of research. You have to spend a lot of time looking at other people's programs that you perceive as successful or more successful than you and and see what the trends are it's and also you have to be lucky and be in the right place at the right time um, and be ready to move when you see something that your gut tells you will help you like if you're buying young bulls you just have to take the risk and um, hope that that their pedigree comes through them and gives you what you are after at least I've bought some bulls from some big programs and uh, young bulls that aren't proven and then they didn't really do anything so I had to continue to um, to look around and take a risk uh, the other alternative is to buy an established bull that's already been well used in other programs with a track record like when I went out and bought concealed weapon I knew who he was I had an idea for what he could bring he'd already had a lot of promotion done on him by other big uh, good quality programs and so that was money very well spent because he uh, he needed no introduction and I could rely on the fact that that he had a production history that people would also assign to my calves even with no horns yet and you know just six months old they, they'd have an assumption that that they could go in the same direction so I guess you that's the place where you end up spending some money but you get a lot a bang for your buck when you're buying something that's already been um, proven and promoted. So is there anything else that you want to share with um, other people about your program or advice or anything like that? Just that um, I love to talk to people. Um, I'm happy to, to give. I'm not saying I'm an expert. I haven't been doing this that long, but if, if I can help anybody or answer some questions, I'm happy to do it. I love visitors. If someone really wants to hear every pedigree on a hundred cows and they have the time I'm willing to try and um, you know no no strings attached come on out and see the cows and I have a big variety I have everything from you know tiny babies to a 92 inch cow so if you want to see what the breed looks like in the, in the modern longhorn looks like I think I can uh, show you that. Thanks, Alice. Thank you very much. You're welcome.